It would be ugly to watch people poking sticks at a cage rat. It is uglier still to watch rats poking sticks at a cage person. Sean Harris the rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of road and kindness, no compunctions, no higher feeling, no friendliness, no anything. E.B. White I will join you. Elf if there is anything I hate worse than elves. It's fucking rat furries going full North Korea with nuclear rocks Eurist. Warhammer, Ravandal's quest the Skaven, both singular and plural, are technologically advanced rat folk in the Warhammer fantasy and Age of Sigma settings. Ugly, evil creatures that spread plague wherever they go and topple kingdoms for fun and profit. You will be hard pressed to find a more unlikable race out there. Much like the orcs, they are so excessively over the top that it's pretty funny. Skaven are said to be the most evil race in the entire setting. And that's no idle claim. For all the Empire, Britonians, Dwarfs, High Elves, Wood Elves and Lizardmen's many flaws. And make no mistake, they are numerous. Each of them has at least some claims to genuine heroism that keep them out of being villains. Undead are either mindless automata executing their programming or, for the majority of intelligent undead, capable of genuine love and altruism. Dark elves are cruel and have a culture based on torture and slavery, but they are more driven by historical grievances and an inhospitable homeland, and can display family loyalty along with traits that some would call decent or even questionably heroic. Orcs and goblins are violent brutes, but they'll develop what could be considered friendships and attachments to their fellows, and even the most brutal black orc will cry if his pet squig dies, not in front of the other boys though. Because they'll completely understand but out of orky manners all see him as nothing but a runty jit. Or at the very least he will bash someone's head into the ground. Point is, he'll grieve. Ogres are well known to be gluttonous and casually cruel almost to a man. But they usually still love their families and their nobler pets. And any man eater worth his salt is good for his word upon payment. Despite their propensities towards killing, scheming, festering and raping. The mortal followers of chaos are capable of honor, friendship and a warped form of love. Even the beastmen, who are also inherently evil like the Skaven, respect their chieftains and shamans, deal honorably with their few allies and give worthy foes a fair fight. Even demons usually respect the chain of command without constantly trying to murder their leaders and take their place. Skaven have none of the above qualities or any other that could be considered even vaguely noble or redeeming. They openly hate everyone and everything, are more cowardly and paranoid than any goblin, more cruel and xenophobic than dark elves, and more fractious than chaos. Love, friendship and honor are completely alien to the Skaven's psyche. This is even reflected in their language. They merely refer to anyone who is not a Skaven as a thing. That is, man things, elf things, you get the idea waiting to be exploited. Due to their chronic backstabbing disorder, nobody trusts them, likes them, or wants to be allies with them, except Dark Elves, who have a treaty with them that both sides betray at times. The only times they have done something that benefited non-Skaven or the world, such as helping beat the first incarnation of Nagash, are for purely selfish reasons. Nagash denied them Warpstone and was a threat to them too. One of the only three reasons the Skaven have lasted this long and not killed themselves in an en masse fratricidal free for all is because their hatred of all other things outweighs their hatred of other Skaven by just enough for them to slightly function. That and their crazy high birth rates or the direct intervention of their god, who's little better than them. However the just enough cannot be stressed enough, even with the all out doom of their race present, as with Nagash or Chaos. They are still intent on fucking each other over. If when possible, Skavenwood will kill each other in the womb. And that's why we love to hate them so much. It should be noted that there is one non-evil one in Warhammer Adventures. The Warhammer Children's Book Series. Yeah, that exists. Named Creech. He's still the villain of that series. But by the standards of Skaven he's damn near a fucking grail knight. Creech actually lives in human culture preferring it to his own people's, and has a 12 year old human slave as his sidekick. Even in children's media there are bastards. 
so who are they in a lot of science fiction going back to starship troopers and likely far earlier. There are races of hive creatures. Vast beings that may have separate bodies, but have one will, one consciousness. Each individual soldier or worker is akin to someone's finger, or a cell on someone's fingertip, and is ultimately an expendable resource in service to the greater whole. All march in lockstep to expand the influence of the Gestalt consciousness as far as possible, either assimilating or crushing anything they come across. The Skaven are the antithesis of this, though this fact in no way makes them nice. The Skaven are a race of walking humanoid rats with dubious, but not to be underestimated, intelligence and a hideous fear all cunning out to conquer the world in the name of their god, the Horned Rat, and also for their own personal gains. If there was one quality which defined their species, it would be raw unconstrained selfishness. By instinct, culture and the will of their arsehole god, each skaven is self-obsessed, paranoid, greedy, power-hungry, murderous and doesn't give a rat's ass, p, for the well-being of anyone that isn't themselves. They find the concepts of love, honor, loyalty and friendship to be so alien they can't comprehend them. In the prisoner's dilemma, they always defect, by nature, each of them is fundamentally evil, and this is not racism speaking here, to give context for this, a greenskin in the end times event was traumatized by the loss of his beloved squig, while no skaven individual has ever, at any point, been shown to have an attachment to any living thing other than themselves. The closest they can get is the exceedingly rare example where a skaven can understand that certain other individuals are tools worth cultivating and protecting from outside threats, and are assets too valuable to allow their casual destruction or squandering. See Nordwill and Queek Headtaker. The only thing a skaven hates more than other skaven is creatures who are non-skaven, and this gives the ratman the vaguest ability to work together when they have a common enemy, otherwise they would fall on each other like, well, a pack of rats. Skaven have an odd relationship with fair. On the one hand, cowardice is the order of the day. They definitely don't want to be sliced, stabbed, shot, skewered, squished, scorched or slarnished. They'll face the perils of battle for the prospects of rewards, killing rival skaven or non-skaven, which they collectively call things, and because their bosses will have them killed horribly if they don't at least try to fight, but most skaven have a reticence to enter battle unless the odds are decidedly stacked in their favor, and they're more prone to breaking and running if things go pear-shaped. On the other hand, skaven have a weird fondness for quick routes to power. If you'd give a skaven a potion which has a 99.9% chance of killing them horribly and a 0.1% chance of giving them the ability to breathe fire like a dragon, many will take it. Remember the saying about a bunch of monkeys with typewriters eventually producing Shakespeare well? At a species level they are sort of like that. Keep throwing rats at the problem to try every cockamamie dunderheraded idea that said collection of drugged up hyperactive megalomaniacs desperate to get ahead can dream up until eventually they stumble on one that works, which others will shamelessly copy while insisting that they had the idea for it first. Skaven are never content with just a cushy job. Cozy 2 bathroom burrow in Scavenblight's suburbs and 2.5 pups to raise or eat if they don't get at least BS in Scaven school. Each one, be he a member on the council of 13 or the lowliest of slaves who's used up and sent to the slaughterhouse, operates under the belief that they are the one true leader of the Skaven whose visionary insights would lead their species to domination of the universe in the name of the Horned Rat. If he can just gain the keys to power and overcome the short-sighted idiots which stand in his way. Introspection and self-reflection are not common skaven traits, though some older skaven like the aforementioned Nordwill and his former protege Sleek Sharp which show that such qualities are possible, even if it's exceedingly rare. In terms of physiology, skaven are shorter than humans, less bulky than them, slightly weaker, surprisingly not as much considering the difference in a size and mass, and generally less in every regard but one, where they do pick up as speed, skaven live their life in perpetual super speed with all its advantages and drawbacks. They move faster, think faster, breed faster and age faster, generally reaching adulthood at 5 months and growing old, 
gray and frail by the age of 13, though very few survive for that long. All that speed builds an almost insatiable appetite, and as they have no body fat reserves, they're always hungry, except maybe after the battle when they can eat the dead, of both sides. Skaven look unnervingly twitchy and energetic to other races, even elves, who also have a kind of inherent super speed, while Skaven see others as slow lumbering idiots. Like rats, the Skaven have a good sense of smell, it is stated by Teclis in Total War, Warhammer 2's High Elves Vortex campaign that they could smell fear and treachery from others. According to Teclis, the horned rat's rat swarm smelled through the fake Galifrius disguises and went for her while ignoring Telerian. This being said though, Stormvermin, who are consistently well fed and trained, tend to grow to the height and weight of a healthy man which may imply Skave naturally may be generally capable of growing to the dimensions of normal men, but few of them get fed enough to achieve this. They live in a massive underground empire known as, well, the Under Empire, with the Horned Rat being the God Emperor, ironically far more successfully than the Other Emperor, which spans through the Warhammer world like the Underdark. The only regions it fails to reach are Althvin because it's a giant floating island and Athelorn because the Skaven diggers get murdered by tree roots or the soil itself refuses to be touched. Its capital is called Skavenblight, and is also one of the only visible signs of Skaven from the surface. Because it is such an indescribable shithole, up until it was teleported to another dimension post 10 times, it's still a shithole though. No one trusts them quite rightly and few other races resist killing them on sight, which is reciprocated in kind. They are more numerous than any other race in the world, and only one enemy keeps them truly in check, themselves. On a very amusing note, the Skaven are one of the rare examples of a race of furries actually liked by most of TG, because they aren't furries. Furries are the result of people role-playing as animals, but still undeniably human. With human characteristics and personality, their self-insert fantasy fulfillment Mary Sue's. The Skaven on the other hand are big fucking vermin that are a reflection of our selfishness, duplicity, and filth. Depending on your pov, they're either more rat than human, or a caricature of the modern human rat race, as ratmen that literally live in their own filth. They're the opposite of furries. Unless you're deepest, most depraved fantasies involve being ravaged by a horde of vermin that is. History rodents of unusual size I don't believe they exist. Free Company Sergeant Roberts. Last words before being killed by a rodent of unusual size Warhammer fantasy no one knows where they came from but it is suspected Siege had a hand in their creation using warp stone. A hideous amount of mutation and generations of breeding with normal rats. That is to say, breeding rats with other rats, not Tsinge breeding with the rats. That's more Slanish's thing. The 7th edition Lizard Manami book states that they came about during the Great Catastrophe. There's a poem in the Skaven Codex, dating all the way back to their first codex in 4th edition, called The Doom of Kavza, written in universe by an author in Tilia, the Warhammer world's equivalent of Italy. It offers what is generally accepted as the most concrete explanation of their origins. To summarize, humans and dwarfs lived together in a city called Kavza, and decided to build a Noblebrite Tower of Babel ripoff to thank the gods for their prosperity. But even dwarf engineering couldn't complete it, so they got some mysterious grey-clad stranger whom the Skaven refer to as the Shaper and who was supposedly her treacherous chaos old one, and maybe the great horned rat before reaching apotheosis into a chaos god, alternatively has been theorized to be constant drachenfuls, to complete it in exchange of him being allowed to add a giant bell as a dedication to his own gods. Upon completion, the temple sealed itself shut, the stranger disappeared, and terrible things happened after the bell rang 13 times. The weather turned bad with constant warp stone laced rain, people got sick, babies were born dead or mutated, crops failed and rats multiplied while growing bigger and smarter. Older Fluff said the stranger cursed the city because the people refused to give him money as well for finishing the temple. Newer Fluff just makes him out to be evil and mysterious, every day. The bell rang 13 times. Rain became hail, then hail became beat or showers. 
The rats kept growing to the point that swarms of rats started preying on humans. Realizing things were becoming Dwarf Fortress, the humans asked the dwarfs for help. The first time the dwarfs turned them down after calling them wimps for complaining about rain. The second time they were a buff due to the rats eating all the dwarfs food. The third time the surviving humans got desperate and smashed open the dwarf gates to demand their help. Only to find bearded dwarf skeletons and well fed, but still hungry. Hordes of rats and the poem ends with them swarming and eating the last surviving humans. TL. DR a wizard met humans and dwarfs. Someone was swindled so magic happens that turns rats into tyrannids. And the rest is history. Notable this story appears to be known in universe. Victor Saltspire mentioned a reference to it at one point in Vermintide. Incidentally, this isn't the only theory presented to their origins, but it's the one most gamers take as canon. Some other and universe origin theories include, an imperial naturalist named Wilfried Stutt argued that the Skaven descend from rats warped into a semblance of a human form by some malign external power, such as chaos. A Tillian classicist, Marcelli Verdallo, argues that the Skaven are living proof of the ancient philosopher Sage Protis theorem that all things in the universe are created by the mystical interactions of cosmic archetypes and beyond time and space, how meter, being the fruit of some union between the archetypes of rat and man. Johannes Kruger's Bestiarium mentions an ancient Australian legend wherein shipwreck survivors turned to cannibalism and were cursed by Manon, the sea god, assuming rat-like forms. That the Skaven were created by Skava, the dwarf ancestor god that's the son of Gazul and cousin to Grimni. Lacking skill in shaping stone and metal, Skava turned to flesh crafting instead and got exiled. He then turned himself into a hideous rat beast and swore vengeance on his blood kin. Also there are a few other origin stories. It is said that after their creation, Skaven spread across the world, learning many cultures, Stealing technologies and magic techniques that could help them in their conquest for Skaven to more personal power. Namely the clan Pestilens who travelled southward and westward and ended up in Lustria. Clan Eshin who travelled eastward and ended up in Cathay. Clan Mulder who travelled northward and established a stronghold in some backwater hellish landscape known as the Helpits near Kielven Norska. Further evidence that the Doom of Kavza is the canon origins of the Skaven is that the poem's author was assassinated by means unknown in universe and copies of the poem keep disappearing. Plus their capital city, Skavenblight, is all but stated to be Kavza, the tower with the bell being the headquarters of the Great Seers. This makes them a surprisingly old race, as they were actually well established before the rise of the Tomb Kings as the undead rulers of Khemri, in fact. They had a grubby little paw in that whole sordid affair. It was the Skaven that supplied Nagash with many slaves and warriors such as savage orcs for him to kill and raise. It was the Skaven that helped Nagash to poison the river Vita, unleashing a magical plague to devastate every living thing in Nehekara. It was also the Skaven who betrayed Nagash by assisting the human Alcadisa in his defeat. Which resulted in the rise of the Tomb King since Nagash was no longer around to control the dead Nehekurans. So, aside from the Dark Elves who taught Nagash the lore of darkness magic that would eventually evolve into the necromancy all vampires love, and the Nehekurans hate, the Skaven were the ones that supported Nagash, making him powerful and undefeated. This is because every time Nagash died, he respawned back to his Black Pyramid. Although it takes a fuckload of time for him to actually get up, it allows him to grasp the mortal world while preserving his existence. Also the pyramid itself is near indestructible so he has no need to trust anyone to guard it. In the end, they still betrayed him for their own selfish desires. Classic Skaven. The Skaven have been popping out numerous times across history, trying to weaken the forces of order to favor themselves in the long run. For example, they appeared during one of the Norsemen invasions, when Sigma was still around. In fear that Sigma's empire might threaten their very existence, they tried to use the invasion as an opportunity to destroy mankind, but failed nonetheless thanks to the dwarfs that were blocking their tunnels. After that, the Skaven didn't lay a hand on the empire until after their own civil war. It was at this time that Clan Pestilence developed a new disease called the Black Plague. 
Nice real life reference GW. Spreading it among the empire's population. The plague not only killed and reduced its population to less than half the size of the generation before. It also killed the current emperor. Boris Golger the. Akka the worst emperor. Who was actually killed by an Eshian assassin shuriken. But who cares. And every other corrupt noble in his hideout. And good riddance some say. Amusingly. His death is actually celebrated as a public holiday. The Skaven then launched their attack after the plague weakened the Empire. But were stopped by a pretty cool guy named Mandad von Zelt of Middenland. Who gathered the rest of the Elector Counts and launched an anti-Skaven crusade. Ironically, the Black Plague played a major role in many of Mandad's victories. Since the disease affected the Skaven as well. Weakening the Skaven army and killing enough of them to force their retreat. In the last battle, the Skaven launched their last counter-attack, only to fail after their leader, Vinik, the warlord of Clan Mors and a member of the Council of Thirteen, was slain by Mandad. The rest of the vermin were then driven back to their under-empire by the Empire's forces while suffering under their own plague from the war. What's worse for the Skaven was that the slaves they bought ended up revolting, and destroyed several already plague-weakened clans while Mandad, who was declared the Emperor and sporting Vramik's own helmet at the time, rebuilt the Empire. The process was faster than the Skaven could expect, with the humans even installing the Sewer Watch to prevent further Skaven movement on the Empire. After such a humiliating defeat, the council received many compensation notices from other disease-ridden clans. But the council decided to just assassinate them all, including our beloved Emperor Ratslayer, and called it even. The assassination made mankind forget about the Skaven, even dismissing them as myth. The Skaven are also pretty famous on the eastern side that Games Workshop refuses to talk about. Clan Eshin's ancestors once journeyed far to the east, losing contact with its society for 100 years. When they came back however, they had learned the art of ninjutsu from some jerk off at Nippon where they have skilled rats throwing shuriken, and freaking ninja flipping better than the chapter master Gabriel Angelos. In Cathay, some filthy beastman and a son Wukong wannabe became the emperor of not China and took an Eshin Skaven warlord as his right hand man. Thus began an unhealthy relationship of trading warp stones and rat shit, which means either the Cathay Emperor is nuttier than a warp fruitcake, which should be obvious since the new emperor was mentioned to be a fucking magical monkey beast man, or probably something worse if he is also like Wukong born from the meteor except the meteor is made of warp stones, or Eshin Skaven are slightly more trustworthy than the rest of Skaven. If you believe total war, they are. They're the only clan that doesn't have to deal with warlord loyalty. It might be true depending on how weeaboo the Eshin has become. If you look up on real world ninja, they do tend to be surprisingly loyal compared to what you might think. However, one could say that the Eastern Legion doesn't really have any experiences with Skaven betrayals. Plus the Skaven did assist the Chaos Dwarfs in the end times to siege Cathay. Meaning everything the Skaven did in Cathay was but a diplomatic ploy to fool the Cathans. As if the Skaven aren't widespread enough, they have the operation worldwide. There is Clan Pestilence in Lustria, who like to infect themselves with diseases that Nurgle doesn't approve of, and throw fesses at lizard things for the lulz. Some of the rats made it into Nagareth, probably as slaves or a few via the Under Empire. While trying not to provoke the wrath of the strongest mama's boy in Warhammer history, the only place they could never set their foot on would be Ulthuen, which is a giant continent that floats on top of the water and obviously can't be connected to Scaven Blight via tunnels. It's regardless just too scary for the rat things to deal with, flame spewing dragon things, elf things that shoot rains of arrows from far away and mages that have the power to summon a giant bombardment of nukes from the sky. The Skaven themselves have no records of their origins, and do not particularly care about their past. As far as they are concerned, the only relevant historical eras are now, when we don't rule the world and soon, when we will be ruling it. Of course, any given Skaven will be plenty interested in the history of his own life. But the history of the rest of their race is dismissed as unimportant. On day-to-day -day affairs, history is whatever the Council of Thirteen says it is. 
though it wouldn't be surprising if Grey Sears keep records. The Ninth Age Age of Sigma the Skaven survived the end of the old world by teleporting Skavenblight to another dimension. When the Horned Rat became the Great Horned Rat he immediately drew Skavenblight into the warp and created more of his demons. What followed was a golden age for the Skaven, where there was warpstone everywhere to be found. They had the direct blessing of the Great Horned Rat, and unlimited space and potential around them. They then promptly did the impossible and somehow dug so deep that part of the warp collapsed into Skavenblight which collapsed into the material realm which is now made up of 8 nearly infinite planes made of the former winds of magic. Skaven now have access to all of reality at once, and can create realm spanning norholes everywhere from beneath Sigma's throne to beneath Korn's throne. As can be expected the tunnels are not stable and thus only the Skaven are willing to use them, as even immortal and deathless demons can somehow vanish into the space between spaces never to be seen again when Skaven are involved. This doesn't mean that the Norholes are completely safe for the Ratkin though. Just the process of constructing one of these interdimensional tunnels costs tens of thousands of live slaves, and when the Norhole is complete, there's a good chance that the big brains in charge of the project were off on their calculations. So instead of tunneling directly into the Merhal, you instead end up in the middle of nowhere or an active volcano. Skaven have also had an exponential population boom, which is impressive considering they damn near outnumbered insects in the old setting, with the other races generally numbering in the millions if not billions and the Skaven numbering potentially in the trillions. Each of the four former great clans from the old world is alive and kicking each other, each containing billions of Skaven and even entire clans. A fifth great clan is Verminous, an especially numerous and martial clan. The techy monstery sneaky stinky niches were taken so someone's gotta make storm them in their thing. However, Scryer, Pestilence, Molder, Eshin and Verminous were not always the only great clans. In the Age of Myth. There were said to be as many as 13 great clans, probably more like 9 or 10 but the Grey Seers rounded up. What happened to the rest a couple of examples, clans Tikrit attempts an invasion of Thandria, a Sigmarite nation, it may as well be Russia in winter with the pantheon of order united, Tikrit is annihilated, clan IKK does well during the tumult of the age of chaos. Gaining a momentous four seats on the Council of Thirteen which sparks a civil war with the equally ascendant clan Verminus. Verminus enlists the help of clan Pestilence to spread an epidemic of froth jaw. The rabid rats get so erratic the other great clans temporarily unite to destroy them. Clan Shrikt digs a huge Norhal and, one by one, its clans disappear through the portal. They were never heard from again, maybe they left to join Ninth Age. The increased scope of AOS law has meant Skaven society is even more chaotic and self-destructive than it was. And this law makes a little more sense than their old world history. You can't expect such volatile societies to maintain a millennia long deadlock between the same four great powers. Still, the current status quo of vying great clans is not that different from the old world's cuz. Those are the models GW sells. The unknown great clans continue the trend of GW giving AOS law lots of missing primarchs, deliberately left gaps for homebrew and headcanon. In the age of chaos, the Skaven nearly obliterated themselves, again, with a massive civil war before the great horned rat himself had to intervene. In action the clans Pestilence profited greatly from their alliance with Nurgle during this time and looked to be rising as the new dominant clan. However, Order managing to push back against this smalliance has meant that the clan Scryer is better poised to vie with Pestilence for preeminence on the Council of Thirteen. They'll probably work it out peacefully, by Skaven standards, meaning only several million rats will die. Skaven continue to be fuck ups at a scale never before witnessed. When Nagash attempted a great ritual of necromantic binding, it was sabotaged by the Skaven nibbling a power cord. Eshin agents had managed to open Norholes in Nagash's Great Pyramid. Huge success for Skaven him well. Maybe had another group not accidentally opened a Norhal at the bottom of the Shyish Sea. Blight City was decimated by a zombie infested flood. Like the day after tomorrow meets World War Z. Hilariously. The drained Shyish Seabed revealed the soul stealing Idanath Deepkin to Nagash. 
Slanesh and everyone else who was wondering about those mysteriously empty towns that smelled faintly of halibut. The moral of the story is clear. You might be able to foil Skaven schemes but it's their fuck ups you wanna watch out for. The era of the beast and Kragnus emergence was ripe with opportunity for the Ratmen, who all felt invigorated by the surging energies emanating from the realm of beasts. The clan's pestilence were able to unleash another of their 13 great plagues, sending grotesquely huge ticks rampaging throughout Blight City and, presumably, into the mortal realms. Not wanting to be outdone by their overzealous rivals, the clan's scryer collaborated with the clan's Mulder once again. This time they experimented with the colossal children of the god beast Fangathrak to create giant parasitic worm monsters to harvest a tar black liquid found in the continent of Anta. When mixed with liquid warp stone, this substance seems to create super skaven, though what will become of these new creations is unclear. Society if you do not know much about rat social behavior, you might be surprised to learn it is fairly well developed and includes among other things evidence of rodent altruism. As you might expect, G-Bubs ignored it entirely to make the scathe more grimdark and work on people's stereotypes of what rats are like rather than how rats interact. Skaven society is literally cutthroat when it comes to promotions, but luckily not promotions. In a world where you have chaos warriors who can honor the chaos gods by killing raping infecting getting minions caught up and expended in complex plots, beastmen which are in a similar lot as chaos on top of animalistic aggression who still practice a survival of the fittest pack mindset based loyalty, orcs that are hardwired to love to scrap. Goblins who are no strangers to backstabbing and dark elves who've literally made assassination and treachery an art. The Skaven have managed to collect the gold medal in, F, Ratricide. After receiving said award they promptly began killing each other to see which Skaven individual got to keep it. The conflict continues to this day, with no resolution in sight. The only reason why their society has not murdered itself into extinction is because of a very high reproductive rate. Despite their team killing tendencies they obey the grey seers, the prophets of their god the horned rat. Although this obedience is done purely out of fear, it is done without question, except for the other grey seers. Hierarchy the Skaven race is ruled over by the council of 13. Skaven of such evil they have been chosen by their vile god and managed to survive the constant threat of assassination. Most likely because everyone is too afraid of these uber ratmen to go near them. Although they squeak big about their plans for world domination, they are too busy trying to outdo and kill each other. Despite the name there are only 12 counselors. The 13th seat is symbolic and reserved for their god and woe betide anyone that tries to sit on it to become a member of the council all any scave need do is touch the sacred black pillar and challenge a current member for his seat in a duel. In practice it has been over 200 years since someone actually managed to pull it off, which is a minor point in favor of the current crop of leaders on it, though a large part of it is that touching the black pillar has a tendency to make rats explode. Beneath the council of 13 are the Grey Seers and the Warlords. Horned, grey-furred Skaven pups are raised to be the priests and magic users of Skavendom that act on behalf of the council. Ironically enough the Skaven are more prone to throw around claims of heresy than the Sigmarite Empire. Not showing proper reverence to the Horned Rat brings down his wrath on the offender and everyone around him. So they take a dim view of anyone who misses their services. Secular rodentism is not something which is going to catch on in Skaven Blight. There is a hard cap on 169. 13x13. 13, 13 being a sacred number to the Skaven, Grey Seers at any one time, though there are a bunch of apprentices waiting in the wings for one to die. Skaven being Skaven, one of the most popular pastimes of said novices is making slots available through assassination. Warlords are those lucky rats that have managed through guile, luck, accomplishment on the battlefield and the elimination of rivals to get in charge of a clan. There is a seer lord on the council of 13 and sometimes you get a grey seer warlord with his own clan, but that's usually the exception. Beneath them, you have an upper crust of prominent individuals within the clans. Warlock engineers. Master Molders, Plague Priests, Assassins, Chieftains, High Ranking Officers and so forth. 
Either through command of some arcane skill or having armed rats behind them they have wealth, better accommodations, hosts of underlings and regular access to breeders. This is also roughly where the Albino Guard rank, since they are basically the Skaven version of Custodes. Underneath them are those with a modicum of cultivated value, the merchants, the technicians, the packmasters, the rank and file of the Stormvermin, the apprentices to the Great Ones, the gutter runners, the overseers, skilled workers and so forth. All of which have to some degree or another got their position by struggling tooth and claw and are with it some measure of power and authority. Most of them rose from the clan rights. Those poor bastards live in poverty packed up like sardines and have to work hard for their daily scavenged trademark sign and fight tooth and claw to keep what little they've amassed. They make their petty schemes. Jump on what opportunities they can and form and break alliances of convince at the drop of a hat. All of which to carve out an itch. Establish a power base and clawing their way up the org chart. Far more likely they end up murdered, expended in battle, blown apart in some accident, killed by a superior making a point or deemed surplus to requirement and left to starve. But even these wretched rats have it better than the scaven slaves. They are the remnants of defeated clans, the pups deemed surplus to requirements if not quite bad enough to be culled, those that earned the ire of their overseers and those whose power struggles failed them and avoided being killed, their status is somewhere between native and the Belgian Congo and pig in a factory farm. Clanrets may be exploited, but scaven slaves are actively worked to death, thrown at the enemy to absorb barrows and are fed a meager diet of scraps, garbage and each other. That's when they are not being taken to the butcher's block so their betters can enjoy a meat dinner and have some leather. The best they can hope for is that a good deal of their superiors fuck up and die or that their clan conquers another leading to enough shuffling in the org chart that they can get promoted to clanmate status. But while clans do wax strong and scavendom produces a lot of said fuck ups it also burns through scaven slaves like nobody's business. Two key facts of this hierarchy are shit flows downhill and the rodent staircase. To a high ranking skaven everyone else is a rival, either an immediate threat or a potential one waiting for the means. So you gotta keep a lid on them. Subordinates are to be given the minimum they need to accomplish their tasks, some rewards if they exceed expectations, and nothing else. If they step out of line they can be beaten, if they cause too much trouble they can be replaced with some up and coming rat eager to not be a scaven slave. If things are going badly for you, assert your dominance with a show of force. Even if things are going well, you should put the fear of the horned rat into your underlings just to remind them who's boss to be on the safe side. This comes before the fact that Skaven are vindictive little shits that have no qualms about taking out their frustrations on others. A sternly worded letter to a warlord from the Council of Thirteen will lead him snapping at his second in command and will eventually manifest itself in clanwoods biting the tails off scaven slaves because they'd been the subject of the ire of their overseers and need to reassert dominance. Likewise if you want to get up, and as mentioned all scaven want to go up all the way, you need to not only excel or have some useful talent but also deal with the million other rats out there with the same ambitions. If you want to survive in the slave pits, shiv your neighbor and eat him to get enough calories so you'll have the strength to see another day. If the clawlader's favorite mug has gone missing, say the guy who's always admired it stole it to bring down the boss's wrath upon him so you have one less rival. The boss's wrath is directed elsewhere and if you happen to be right he just might throw you a bone for being, due to the lack of a better word, loyal. Apprentices could and should steal the ideas of their fellows to become warlock engineers. Attempting to police the skaven to stop such backstabbing is usually an exercise in futility, especially since whatever police rats you can scrounge up will inevitably engage in said activities on their own. Not that it matters much in most cases, there is always a fresh stream of replacements and those eager for dead rats shoes. At most murder provides an excuse for removing individuals that they don't like and a move that is slightly less likely to spark the paranoia of your rivals. A good scaven leader knows how to use this competition to keep his minions in line and to get the most out of them. 
A bad Skaven leader is going to end up on the barbecue sooner rather than later. This is the case from birth. Even for those whose role was determined at birth like Grey Sears and Storm Vermin have to fend off both ruthless instructors and backstabbing fellow applicants. Nobody is unscathed. So I don't know if you know this, but we've got a website with lots of models. And whenever I say lots of models, I mean lots of models. We've got models for any setting that you can think of. With humans with biddies, animals that shouldn't have biddies but do have biddies, dwarves and elves with biddies. Look, we've got a lot of smut models. But it doesn't stop there. We really do have models for anything and everything. And to be honest, they look so good. Chef's kiss, so good. But it's not all smart for all you good Christian Minecraft server players. We've got you covered. And we even got the weebs covered too, which is unusual for this channel because we don't <laughs> like weebs. <laughs> yeah, the weebs aren't that bad. <laughs> we, also, just that bad. <laughs> we also have 5th edition subclasses and adventures, which some of them are free for download. And we sell a physical printed copy of Steel Water as well. And you can request a signed version, if that's your thing, where I'll draw a penis on it for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hey, if you want you know, us to sign a couple decks, want, that's we, we'll, what you we'll, want. We'll give you decks, okay, guys? That's, that's what anyway, we Anyway, if you enjoy what we do here, go ahead and check out the website. It helps us out so, so much. And we don't need to worry about our YouTube overlord striking down another one of our channels. Our website is also now available as an app on Android. Also, and the winner of the daily giveaway is this guy. Yay! Woo! <laughs> Look, anyway, uh, in for a chance to win, all you gotta do is like, subscribe, leave a comment down below, automatically entered in. And to claim the prize, you just send an email to neckbeardycontact at gmail.com. Let's get back to the video. Misc, although unintentional on the side of writers, there are circumstances where real life rats can become scaven like. In a series of social experiments involving overpopulation designed to see what effects human overpopulation in cities like New York or Tokyo could be paralleled, rat populations with far too many beings and far too small an area begin to go, as individuals, insane while the group becomes far more violent despite having more than enough food and water to sustain the entire population. When a high density population that shows these behaviors is given more area to roam and by having another set of open cages attached or being shifted to smaller population cages, the behavior remains the same meaning the rats have been permanently mentally damaged. Only with successive generations do they regain sanity. So in a way, Skaven have inadvertently made themselves fucking insane by choosing to live in horrible conditions and to overpopulate. Theoretically Creech from Warhammer Adventures shows that saner and more level-headed, if not necessarily less evil, generations of Skaven could emerge if the species got access to more room and better conditions, and was completely removed from its old environment and the previous rats who inhabited it. In fact, if the root of the Skaven's evil nature could be traced to both their terrible environment and the terrible culture that both feeds and feeds off of that environment rather than anything genetic, theoretically, there could actually be good Skaven if they were somehow separated from Skaven Blight immediately after birth and raised outside of it by someone willing to give them a chance. However, seeing as how the primary engines of Skaven reproduction are heavily guarded at the very heart of Skaven Blight, and literally every other race in Warhammer is hardwired to kill the mangy rat bastards on sight. And with fucking good reason. Such a thing will almost certainly remain purely theoretical. Especially since all that trouble would ultimately amount to little more than proving a petty point. With little to no real payoff beyond making the horned rat personally pissed off at you. Then again there are some that might find that outcome a goal in and of itself. Funnily enough. In real life the common rat is actually highly social, friendly, adaptable, clean, curious and even altruistic of all things. Even in wild population much less human pet rats, fancy rats. One could imagine the Skaven in some nobler bright nobler dark warhammer setting basically outcompete all the other races and then dragging them kicking and screaming, at least not the crazy ones into some wider federation or empire while turning the world into an atom punk. Warp punk. Setting. Wait. This sounds awfully familiar. Arm is the rank and file scaven slaves. Large numbers of starved scaven slaves are thrown at the enemy's front lines with crummy scrounged up improvised weapons to waste arrows. 
bog down enemy movements and hopefully take down a few man things by sheer numbers. Some lucky ones get to annoy the enemy at range with slings, which is sort of a luxury as nobody else in the army can take them. Clan rats. The basic rank and file of a clan with some armor and better if still basic weapons. Swords, shields and spears. Better fed, more durable and less likely to run than scavenged slaves. They are good enough that you expect them to do a bit more than just absorb arrows and tire out the enemy sword arm. Even so they're still cannon fodder that relies on numbers against all but the crummiest of foes. Fortunately for the warlords they are never in short supply. Various campaign supplements would expand on the basic clan rot with unique variations for each great clan, like the rotten rodents of clan pestilence, who trade their shield for an extra hand weapon. Storm them in. Basic elite units for when you want something that has more staying power than clan rights. Black furred pups are singled out to be soldiers. They get given extra food, ruthless Spartan way training, better weapons and armor than the common riff rats and take some pride in their units, which means that they are less likely to randomly stab their fellow storm women in the back than most skaven and any failure to meet the standards is liable to get a storm women executed on the spot for not measuring up. They normally got a bully mentality, cruel, mean. Petty and vindictive along with an internalized need to constantly put on a strong face, pride and ability and station and chest puffing arrogance that mostly covers for the fact that they are still cowards at heart. The clans Moors and Rictus are known for their particularly nasty regiments of storm women and regularly sell themselves to the other aspiring warlords for a sizable sum. Albino Guard, the personal guard of the Council of Thirteen, made entirely out of white furred pups and put through even more brutal training than the regular storm women. They're also psychotically loyal to those they protect, like the cot and the grey seers, quite unlike the vast majority of Skaven. Most of them are warlord sized, with gear and skills to match. Chieftain, the Skaven equivalent to a greenskin big boss or empire captain. They serve under the warlord as his enforcer and field commander. Usually it's from this rank that new warlords are promoted. Warlord, also called clawlords in AOS. Warlords are not the best fighters of a Skaven clan, but the most cunning. They lead the ravenous swarms of ratmen into combat from the safety of the rear lines. They get first pick of any loot they come across and play a constant game of 3D chess with their subordinates to make sure they keep their position and their lives. Specialists poisoned wind globade ears. An elite core of clan scryer clan rats trained in the usage of special glass spheres filled with toxic vapors. They lob said orbs at hordes of enemy troopers where they shatter, dispersing their poisonous payload into the air to protect themselves. The glob ideas wear special breathing equipment on the common chance one of their globes is faulty. TWW2 introduces a more potent type of poison called the death globe, whose toxins are harmful even with the slightest of skin contact. In AOS, they are renamed to scryer acolytes and function as interns for the various engineers, weapons teams, clan scry's bread and butter. A vast collection of various weapons all designed to be carried by a pair of Skaven and have a staggeringly high rate of explosive failure. The warp fire thrower is a crude fire hose connected to a gas tank that spews a corrosive fluid that ignites upon exposure to air. It was created to melt through heavily armored dwarf and shield walls during their first wars against the beard things. Rattling guns are the Skaven's take on real world gatling guns. Six barrels of rapid fire warp stone bullets all powered by a hand crank. Said cranking mechanism is prone to overheating and explosion should the gunners get too eager on the spinner. For more precise weaponry, the warp lock Jezel provides. It's an oversized rifle held in place by a rickety shield and built to deliver lethal warp stone bullets into the heads of an enemy leader from miles away. A doom flare is what happens when you take the green goblin's pumpkin bombs and turn it into an armored chariot. These bladed balls were originally meant for tunnel clearance and mowing down pesky dwarf battle lines. Similarly, the warp grinder was also initially made for utility purposes, serving as a quick means of excavating new underways, though it was soon reproposed for drilling into armored units and bastions. Finally the poisoned wind mortar. The grown-up version of the Globadier, 
These mini artillery pieces launch lethal spheres of toxic fumes across the battlefield to choke the lives out of enemies. Though it is the only weapons team to not make the jump to Age of Sigma. For some goddamn reason. And naturally there's also the Death Globe Mortar in TWW2 as well. Night Runners. The initiates of Clan Eshin. Having yet to fully grasp the importance of discipline, stealth, and basic fucking patience. They run headlong into enemies throwing sharpened metal stars and knives at them. They do have their uses though. Serving as excellent skirmishers thanks to their range attacks and natural agility. Gutter Runners. Those lucky few night runners who survive their first battle and learn how to stand still are soon claw picked to become gutter runners. These elite teams are the main agents of Clan Esh and you'll find. Often hired for sabotage, espionage, eating fromage, and of course assassination. TWW2 adds an even more elite variant of the gutter runners called the death runners, who are noted for having zero armor and simply dodging most attacks. Assassin. Pretty straightforward. Picked from the most elite of gutter death runners. These expert killers are so feared among the under empire that rumors spread about them having special abilities. From squeezing into a coin sized hole to having a poisonous shadow. Outlandish that may sound. Clan Eshin isn't one to confirm or disperse these rumors. Eshin Sorcerer. One of the ninja clan's better kept secrets. In addition to being rigorously trained in the arts of murder and sabotage like the other initiates, these skaven are capable of wielding their own unique magic called the Law of Stealth, likely a mixture of shadow magic and the standard skaven Law of Ruin. As expected, the Night Lord doesn't want too many people to know about their existence, Grace is in particular, so much so that they vanished from the Law and Tabletop for a while until TWW2 brought them back into the limelight. Packmaster, part slave driver, part animal tamer. Packmasters are adepts of clan Molder who specialize in the care of their menagerie of beasts. Often recruited from the meanest bullies, they are cruel and relentless with their whips and spiked prodders which double as a means of defense as well as a way to encourage their monsters to fight harder. Some also are known to carry large snapping claws on pole arms called thing catchers, which they eagerly use to grab new test subjects whilst on the battlefield. Giant rats, the most common symbol of clan Mulder's monsters. They're just big ass rats, usually the size of a small domestic dog. They are herded into massive swarms by their pack master, S, to drown the foe in furry bodies. Pox rats, a step up from the giant rat. These boar-sized rodents are commonly used as mounts for various skaven leaders, though as their sickly name suggests, the plague priests of clan pestilence are particularly fond of them. Rat ogres, the premier product of clan Mulder, through a fusion of skaven, ogre, and countless other beasties, a hulking monstrosity was born. Ill-tempered, violent brutes who serve as shock troopers bodyguards for skaven armies, like actual ogres. They are very strong but also quite dumb. Despite this, they can be equipped with several rudimentary upgrades and weapons for more specialized needs. During the end times, Clan Scryer improved upon the base Rat Ogre and created the even more dangerous Storm Fiend. By adding a secondary brain via and tiny ass Skaven Slave to the beast's back, they can now operate more advanced weaponry, such as warp fire projectors, short gauntlets, rattling guns, and many more, while still keeping the same base level instincts and loyalty they are known for. Brood Horrors. What happens when you cram a bunch of starved pox rats into an enclosed area and leave them alone for a while well eventually only one of them remains having swallowed whole all of its packmates and bloated to monstrous sizes. It has now become a brood horror. A hideously mutant creature that's either used as a standalone monster or as a mount for the most daring of warlords. Help it abomination. And you thought the brood horror was grotesque. Named after the capital warren of clan Mulder. The help it abomination is a Frankenstein fusion of leftover body parts, machinery, and gallons of liquid warpstone given unholy life. No two abominations are quite alike. Though they all have the general shape of a massive multi-headed centaur rat. Plague monks. The zealous followers of clan pestilence. Less armored than a clan rat. 
These ragged devotees rush into battle with filth encrusted robes and rusted blades while chittering prayers and wishes to the horned rat. Each one is infected with enough viruses and sickness that just being in the vicinity of them is detrimental to your health. They gladly throw themselves onto foes to smother them in corruptive ilk and often carry tomes full of various litanies and vows to their pestilential deity. Plague Sensor Bearers the more rabid plague monks who don't become plague priests will often be given the privilege of carrying large sensor flails that are blessed with filth and constantly emit toxic fumes. They then rush headlong into combat swinging their weapons to create a noxious cloud of gas, invigorating their brethren and smothering their enemies. Much like the similar in concept night goblin fanatics. Plague sensor bearers have a short life expectancy as the fumes are so toxic that it can even kill the rats of clan pestilence, albeit very slowly. Plague priest, looking more like champions of Nurgle rather than Skaven, these pox-filled vermin are the heads of the pestilent brotherhood. They lead vast congregations of sickly followers on a holy mission to corrupt the world in the name of the great horned rat. The most distinguished priests often ride into battle upon massive plague furnaces, a rickety siege engine centered around a giant swinging sensor, constantly filling the air with toxic warpstone fumes. These fumes invigorate the warriors of clan pestilence and choke the life out of all others. Clans can organize themselves into clans, through which they organize their backstabbing. The individual backstabs for position within a clan. The clan backstabs for position in Skaven society. There are many clans, far more than any being other than the Horned Rat, presumably, knows. Clans rise, fall, split, infight, reform, and even ally constantly. Each clan seeks to have one of their members in a position in the Council of Thirteen, which runs the business of their entire race. The Council of Thirteen is conveniently organized like a clock, with Thirteen at the Twelve position which is representative of the Horned Rat. Members are called Lords of Decay. Each position is more powerful within the Council based on their proximity to the Horned Rat, so the Lords of Decay at the One and Twelve position are the two most powerful, two and eleven behind them, while the Lords of Decay at the Six and Seven positions are the weakest. Each Lord of Decay can outright veto the position of the one opposite them. Each Lord of Decay has their position marked by a symbol, either that of themselves or that of their clan. The Lords of Decay have thus far remained in power for most of the existence of the Council thanks to the life-prolonging warp stone they use. So Skeksis, although they rise and fall in power, Skaven clans fall into three categories, Great Clans, Warlord Clans, and Thrall Clans. The four great clans are extremely powerful, and epitomize the different aspects of Skaven society. Each greater clan later became a type of clans in Age of Sigma due to an exponential population boost. Warlord clans are essentially the middle class of Skaven, usually doing their own thing and not tied to any specific great clan. The Thrall clans are weaker warrens that swear allegiance to a great clan to survive or grow in power. Of course thanks to Skaven backstabbing, a Thrall clan is an expendable frontline infantry source while the great clans are just sources of really neat toys like rat ogres and rattling guns. And of course every clan is waiting to betray each other while making allegiances to other clans and to betray their real allies that they are of course waiting to be backstabbed by while totally being unaware of the fact that a fourth set of clans have set up the backstabbing conga for their own benefit. And so on as far as you want to get into it. Note. This describes a single day of plotting also. When fielding an army, one or two clan paint jobs and multiple thrall clan paint jobs are quite fluffy. The four great clans are Clanashin, the ninja assassin clan, murder all of these, Clan Molder, the clan which breeds monsters and sews them together Frankenstein style to make even better, by Skaven standards, slightly less volatile, monsters, Clan Pestilence. The founder of the Pestilent Brotherhood and the largest and most powerful Pestilent Brotherhood member, Clan Scryer, the clan which produces warp-powered Tesla cannons, machine guns, vehicles, and other assorted machines. Clan Worms, 
the clan that clan Mulder replaced and clan Pestilence betrayed to get on the Council of Thirteen, specialized in utilizing the various invertebrates of the deep underground places of the world as weapons and tools for scavendom. Giant scorpions and swarms of venomous insects were their main military contribution, with worm oil for lighting being their main non-military contribution. Their lair in Scavenblight was a huge wasp nest looking structure called the Hive. When Clan Mulder proved better able to create horrific war beasts, and Clan Scryer created warp stone lights, they essentially became worthless, especially after their various vermin helped spread the Black Plague among the Under Empire and were betrayed by the other Skaven, looked down upon so much even the lowest of slave clans spit upon them. In addition, there are the Grey Seers, silver-furred Skaven with horns that represent the servants of the council and the horned rat. They are above all Skaven other than the Lords of Decay and as a result tend to be somewhat free from the backstabbing conga, other than that of other Grey Seers. Any Grey Skaven who do not have horns are part of the council guard, the elite warriors that protect the council and the grey seers. However those skaven that protect the council of 13 directly are the albino guard, purely white furred giga storm vermin. Deity the skaven worship their creator the horned rat, a god as sickening and vile as they are, god of disease and vermin. Thankfully he gets the crap kicked out of him by Sigma and Sotek on a regular basis and frankly anyone that feels like having a go. He got fed up with such bullshit at the end times, telling the Skaven to stop backstabbing each other and get shit done, which they proceed to do by destroying many cities. He also made a deal with the Chaos Gods as he cannot defeat them. As of Age of Sigma, Slanesh was kidnapped by three elf gods that were formerly mortals, Tyrion, Teclis, Morellian, at the manipulations of Tsinch and the newly appointed Hanik of all Chaos Archaeon. This resulted in Nurgle and Khorne immediately voting with them to boot him out of the Pantheon and the Great Game and promoting Horned Rat to proper Chaos God in his place. Horned Rat immediately renamed himself Great Horned Rat, but found out that the big kid's table was full of backstabbing assholes with absolutely no respect for each other, and somehow even less for him. When the Chaos Gods gave Archaeon their blessings, Archaeon rejected the Horned Rat's blessings and spat directly in his face for daring to presume GHR can bless the self-righteous ass that is Archaeon, though this could just be Archaeon not having absolutely abysmal standards. Magic Skaven wield a form of dark magic fueled by Warpstone and derived from their own inherently corrupt abilities. However, only select kinds of Skaven are capable of actually tapping that energy. Traditionally, only the Grey Seers, rare mutants who function as the Skaven shamans and the warlock engineers of Clan Scryer, who use magitech devices to draw upon and manipulate dark magic, possesses power, but that lore has fluctuated over editions. In 4th edition, warlocks could be 1st to 3rd level casters, with Grey Seers being 4th level casters and both use the same law of Skaven magic system. In 6th edition, only Grey Seers were casters, still using the law of Skaven, Warlock engineers instead had to spend points on Magitek weapons that also allowed them to cast a single spell, Warp Lightning. However, the optional rules for Great Clan armies in the back of the book also featured clan base casters. These lesser mages were treated as level 1 casters who only knew a single pre-selected spell. Clan Eshin had sorcerers, Skitterleap, Clan Pestilence had festering chanters, Pestilent Breath, and Clan Molder had harbingers of mutation, Vermintide. Clan Skyer's Warlock Masters could still only cast Warp Lightning, but could try and cast an 11 plus variant that was much more powerful. In 7th edition, things changed. Now, Skaven had two different schools of magic, Ruin and Plague with Warlock Engineers being hero level casters of Ruin and Plague Priests getting an upgrade to be hero level casters of Plague, with Grey Seers being Lord level casters who could mix and match spells from both laws, and had access to the unique dreaded 13th spell, which could transform enemy troops into Skaven clan rites. Children of the Horned Rat, the Skaven sourcebook for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition, tweaked the Skaven magical laws around. Naming the two primary schools of Skaven magic as Plague and Warp, it also upgraded Eshin sorcerers to full-fledged casters, 
with their own unique school of magic, the Dark Lore of Stealth, a corrupt form of shadow magic that lets them do more animesque ninja stuff. As Kotha was written around the time of 6th edition, it doesn't quite mesh up with either 6e or 7e fluff. Instead of being masters of all the Skaven styles, it's implied, it's a little hard to ascertain, that Grey Seers only use warp magic, whilst Plague Priests and Eshin Sorcerers only use Plague Magic and Stealth Magic respectively. Warlock Engineers, meanwhile, can't use magic at all but instead can make unique magitech gizmos. Also, Kotha says that rogue grey seers can learn chaos magic or necromancy, although this paints them as skaven heretics. Army skaven are your standard easily abused horde army. Lots of cheap vermin, whose numbers allow them to easily ignore their one theoretical weakness. Shitty leadership, backed up by more expensive and or specialized units that are in theory unreliable but will still wreck your shit more consistently than most anything else by sheer volume. Also, Doom Wheels. Under current rules they are have always been considered overpowered, except for a brief period where Doc reigned thanks to your spiritual liege. They have now reclaimed their mantle, since 8th edition heavily favors mass infantry blocks and the Skaven can easily throw out a block of 100 models for less than what some other armies will spend on a lord. No, I'm not exaggerating, which under the current rules is virtually unbeatable. Fun facts they consider the number 13 to be lucky holy. This a reference to how 13 is seen as unlucky in western society. However, several real life nations cultures consider 13 a lucky number. Grey Seers regularly ride giant bells on scaffolds and a battle doom wheels in ye olden days they could be led by friggin master splinter I'm not kidding this was a thing their leaders lead from the back, to get a better view of the battle of course and not you to the meat shield tactic, they can improve anything, with the addition of magical radiation rocks this may or may not involve improving themselves by snorting said rock, giant lightning cannons backstabbing little bastards, They'll fuck you up 5 different ways without you even knowing about it. If you're lucky, Skaven do not abide by any codes of honor or battle etiquette, and as such, they will bring a gun to a sword fight, and even then they'll try to steal your sword beforehand, and poison you, and improve themselves with warp stone before. Ah and the gun might be a doom wheel. Skaven have a combination of ego and incompetence that would make Starscream look down his nose at them. Bad comedy right there. Skaven do not think about the potential consequences of anything that they do. Taken to its logical conclusion in the end times when they blow up the Mithurfucking Chaos Moon and nearly destroy the planet with moon fragments. At one point they had the cheapest troops in any game setting. How cheap it was measured in fractions of a point they can carry giant rocket launcher weaponry that will most likely explode in their own damn faces. Rattling guns are just cool as they sound and yes, it does what it says on the tin for the last time. Master Splinter did not teach all of Clan Eshin how to all be ninja rats, only a few as of Total Warhammer II. Skaven's can into space. No. Seriously, go play the campaign, BTW, they also have sniper rifles, warp stone rifles of instant brain pop, yes yes thematic stuff in Warhammer, seriousness and fast walk hand in hand, some factions are in general more jokey like the greenskins and others are more somber like the drutchy eye, but all of them are capable of both, this is especially true of the scaven, on the one hand, they are a malignant horde of self-centered sociopaths in which every twisted manifestation of this fact is explored, driven on by a malevolent deity, spreading underground like a cancer that surges forth to lay waste to the realms of men, leaving nothing behind but ruins and gnawed bones, and they are ultimately responsible for bringing about the end times. On the other hand they are a species of cartoonish rat guys with mad science super weapons, Ninjas and convoluted plots that often blow up in their filthy faces with odd verbal tics which can, despite it all, sometimes be, well, cute. Ugly cute, but cute nonetheless. The Skaven have no direct counterpart in Warhammer 40,000. In of itself this is not unprecedented. 
After all, neither do the lizardmen or vampire counts and on the same note you don't have any TAU or Tyranids having raves in Athel lore and keeping the wood elves up. Also noting the two settings while starting remarkably similar diverge heavily in the intervening decades. So one for one comparisons aren't completely applicable anymore. Even so, they do seem to be a natural fit. After all, they are one of the most technological factions and it's not a huge leap to imagine their space fleets and similar. They're also GW original content. So why are they not a thing? One possible answer is that while they could fit into 40k, they would be kind of redundant. Simply put the role of theocratic empire with cutthroat internal politics ruled through fear, driven by hatred of the other on which a small privileged elite rules over a vast ocean of individuals living cheek to jowl in huge labyrinthine warrens either as disposable factory workers or soldiers expended like ammunition is already filled in 40k. In fact the parallel may be more direct than accidental given that there are explicitly 13 high lords of terror. Same as the 13 Lords of Decay. In addition a big issue would be how they would integrate with a somewhat darker tone of 40k as a whole. As an alien race of ratmen would harder to justify next to true Xeno horrors such as the Tyranids or Necrons. The Elder and the Orcs being easier conversions for a sci-fi race. Which is also a big reason why squats took so long to come back. As they needed a less campy integration into the 40k lore. In contrast the Empire of Man is not the Shire or some other idealized fantasy utopia, but on the same note and of itself it's not actually that bad by the standards of the era it was based on. Most of its big problems are external, chaos, greenskins, drachii, whatever, and most of the crappiness you'd find in it is the sort of stuff you'd find in basically every early modern state along with the virtues thereof. In some ways it's better than the other good guy factions. As to how this pertains to the Skaven, a way they are often framed is as a dark mirror of mankind. One in which our virtues are absent and our common failings are magnified. In particular they reflect modern mankind's excesses. Beings which are intelligent, but driven solely by greed, lust for power and hatred for the other. They see everything and everyone else as an expendable resource driven towards endless growth and expansion consuming everything in their path, leaving wastes in their wake. They don't think in terms of the future. They can drop a bomb on that bridge when they come to it. All that matters is you, here and now. In that regard, the Skaven are a better green Aesop story than the near do wells of the Captain Planet. Furry edition. Die die man things the above sentence clearly illustrates the quirks of Skaven language, which is titled Queekish. They often say certain monosyllabic words twice. Words like die die and full full are popular. Skaven are also known to link similar related words together. Some people believe these things should only be done to the most important part of a sentence. However, in some official works, such as Total Warhammer II, these quirks are applied seemingly at random in Skaven speech. Also, they often end the name of a species with the suffix things. So men are man things, dwarfs are dwarf things, etc. This helps indicate that non-Skaven are not people in their eyes. Although considering their backs to be natures it isn't as if they're trying to avert sense of shame or horror from killing others, which is why humans dehumanize during war. So why likely the Skaven equivalent of racial slurs? Female Skaven The Skaven as a whole fit the idea of Ratman with particular emphasis on the men part. All named Skaven characters are male, and new fans invariably wonder. What about females where do Skaven come from there was never any great emphasis placed on them. Indeed, they were left so ambiguous that the first ever description of Skaven females actually came about as a result of one fan's fanfiction, during those hoary days when gnomes and half-orcs were still canon. In the Book of the Rat, a fan-made netbook of Skaven lore for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition, female Skaven were stated to exist but were hugely oppressed. They were kept as sexual slaves in segregated chambers of the Warren, to which only the clan's elites were allowed access. Kept in miserable conditions, their life consisted of nothing but rough sex, pregnancy and looking after their mewling rattlings. Female Skaven were described as rarer than male Skaven, partially due to biology, 
primarily because their mothers and the bitter, infertile elderly midwives tended to be particularly callous towards the female offspring and so female scathed have a much, much higher mortality rate than the males. When we got official law, however, it turned out to be far worse. When the first ever Warhammer Armies, Skaven's source book was released, way back in Warhammer 4th edition, fans were presented with what is the earliest known mention of Skaven females. A single line describing them as being indolent and semi-intelligent in the general Skaven entry in the best eerie section. Page 50. Modern Law. Established in the Skaven 6 e army book and preserved since then. Built upon this singular line and is considerably more grimdark than the fanon presented in the book of the rat. Female Skaven are horrific monsters, implied to be basically female giant rats of enormous stature, who build upon their description in 4e by being described as feral, effectively non-sapient creatures. They are basically giant wombs locked away separately from the males and existing only to feed and produce offspring, so monstrously pregnant and indolent that their limbs have atrophied, rendering them incapable of doing anything but wallow in the breeding pits. Further female Skaven lore, such as it is, was fleshed out by black library fiction and most prominently by Children of the Horned Rat, a Skaven source book for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition, in Cotha. It's theorized that only 1 in 10 Skaven are female, reaching sexual maturity at the age of 2 and spending the rest of their 2 decades of life doing nothing but breed, averaging 12-24 pups a litter and 4-5 litters per year. What's truly grimdark however, as explicitly stated in that same book is, that Skaven females are actually not naturally like this, rather, their condition is the result of the Skaven's malevolence and their need to improve upon nature. From a young age, Skaven females are constantly dosed with warpstone-based narcotics and hallucinogens, intended to keep them docile and segregated, so they will not protest their life of endless baby making. There is a single line hinting that this may not be as effective as the males Skaven think. So cloistered away from the rest of their race are they that they do not learn their race's chittering speech, nor are they proficient in even the simplest social skills, or so the Skaven believe, but still the vast majority of rat mothers spend their lives incessantly pregnant and in an interminable drug-fueled haze, often blind and or crippled, and dependent on the ministrations of the rat wives castrated Skaven who serve as nurses to the female Skaven themselves and midwives to their endless litters. TL. DR. Skaven females are practically furry demon cuniber. Access to the females is carefully guarded. The most powerful of Skaven are allowed to own one or more females for their private use. Females are readily traded between clans as extremely valuable bargaining chips and access to the communal females in the breeding pits is restricted to high-ranked or otherwise successful Skaven. In one of the Gotrok and Felix novels, a Skaven is rewarded by his superior by being given permission to mate with one, whilst Thanquil's doom features a Skaven who partially lost his nose in an incident whilst mating with a breeder. Apparently, she got too excited and tried to eat him. The female Skaven's status as bloated, indolent baby makers was referenced in the end times. In end times, Thankful, a dwarf slayer separated from the other during the battle of Kerak Eight Peaks found his way into a Skaven breeding pit filled with hundreds of females in such a state, their litters and a handful of rat wives. He killed the rat wives, the breeders and their litters. There being so many Skaven the Slayer's arms got sore from all the killing. Then the Slayer stumbled upon another breeding pit just as big, but by then Skaven soldiers had discovered what he did in the previous breeding pit so they swarmed him and slaughtered him. The End Times is the most recent lore on this, so it looks like the baby factory fate is canon for most, if not all, female Skaven. It bears mentioning that the status of the breeders does have some real world basis to it. The rodent contains the only known eusocial mammals, the mole rats, who live in colonies consisting of a single reproducing female with one, or up to three, for naked mole rats, reproducing males reigning over a large brood of sterile offspring that work as a collective to survive. In these cases, however, there are equal numbers of males and females, 
and it's the presence of a breeding queen and her pheromones that causes sterility into the younger male rats, if removed from her presence, they become fertile in turn. It also bears mentioning that, in Blood Bowl, the Skaven team comes with cheerleaders who are non-breeder females, which you can tell because they have 4 big breasts each, but then, Blood Bowl also has femorks, so its connection to canon of any addition after 3 is kind of dubious. Beastman connection so, since this is a race made of humanoid rats empowered by warpstone, which is officially described as being chaos energy manifest, you may be wondering whether or not they're beastmen. Well, the answer is that it kind of flips back and forth. Way back in the early editions, yes, Skaven were explicitly a breakaway faction of relatively stabilized beastmen, even pitching in with the hordes of chaos or spawning chaos champions of their own. The designer demon prince chaos god rules in 3e e slaves to darkness. The lost and the damned even features a scaven turned demon prince of chaos undivided. Since then, the connection has been downplayed extremely. The empire generally describes scaven when they acknowledge they exist as just beastmen who happen to look like rats. But there's no official connection between the two other than the fact grey seers have horns that signal them as important a classically beastman tray, and the fact both are animals mutated by chaos stuff. Children of the Horned Rat, the Skaven Splat book for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, does note the existence of Grey Seers who have turned to chaos magic, as well as necromancy, who are regarded as heretics amongst the rest of their kind. Some fluff blurbs imply that Skaven are to dwarfs as beastmen are to humans and they do share a lot of trays craftsmanship ability, pride, vindictiveness and skew gender ratios for example, though twisted and or exaggerated on the Skaven side. In WFRP1E, it was stated that a spell that removes chaos taint could turn a beastman into a human if that beastman survived having all that taint burned away. While the description didn't say what would happen if it was used on a Skaven, following the logic of this paragraph would say that using it on a Skaven and said Skaven managing to survive would turn it into a dwarf. In Age of Sigma with the two factions technically now united under chaos there still doesn't seem to be much kinship with the two groups, neither interacting beyond temporary alliances or in battle, and generally the other races seem to treat the Skaven and the Beastmen as two different groups. There has also never been any real evidence of humans or otherwise mutating into Skaven unlike Beast Man. So any connection, if there is any, is scant at best and still best viewing both factions as different groups but with some surface level similarities. Warhammer 40k while no direct space Skaven exist, there are rat-like mutants described in the fluff, rat-worshipping cultists in Necromunda. A mutant race called Ratlings which despite being more halfling than rat could be argued as a successor. The many aspects of the Imperium society is an analog to the Skaven society. Its people are uneducated and amoral xenophobes who are mass bred and treated as currency and is also the most numerous in the setting. Furthermore, many of its people lived in a poor yet mass crowded city environment called the Hive City where they practice cannibalism. Corpse starch. Due to the shortage of food, Imperium's major institutions also mirrored to the Skaven's four major clans in many ways, creating super soldiers, space marines, using flesh cruft and brutal training in the most immoral way possible, super assassins, officio assassinorum, that can silent anyone, be it foes, misbehaving bureaucrats, commander, or traitors technology specialist, adeptus mechanicus, who has no idea on how their technology works with most of their inventions being made out of two old inventions combined, dug from ancient blueprints, STC, or from stealing Xeno technologies, fanatically loyal religious zealots, Ekelshiaki, who had almost doomed the Imperium with a massive civil war, age of apostasy, on top of it all, their figurehead, the emperor of mankind was a man with near godlike power, who had demigod-like sons commander in the form of Primarch working for him. Interestingly, Robout Gilliman is the only active Primarch in the Imperium and he is the 13th son of the Emperor. Coincidence I think not Balam Heresy, 
And lastly there are the Tyranids who are 40k's version of ungodly numbers faction crossed with the Ogre Kingdom's motivation to eat everything in sight, though for different reasons. The Harald used to be the space scave, as in giant diesel punk rad people, but that was pretty much retconned. They look different now, on the rare occasion they are mentioned in the fluff, so the only actual space scave now the Veer mine from Warpath by Mantic Games. Their models aren't the greatest things ever, but offer great potential for conversions into stuff for clan scryer and warlock engineer stuff for fantasy. It looks like the recent Skiterii model releases may have taken inspiration from the Skaven aesthetic, though not gameplay, with their many steampunk styled weapons, most notably the Transuranic Arquibus and Radium Jezel. Alternatively, the Jenna Steeler cults are a particularly close match gameplay wise with lots of ambushing troops and monsters backed up by armor and artillery. Also, the Skaven once accidentally called the Elder on their far squeaker. The Skaven were scared shitless when they heard a voice like an elf's coming from the other end. Presumably the Skaven don't have enough numbers or high enough technology at the time of Age of Sigma to attempt to travel through a Norhal to the 40k galaxy and utilize their usual antics without fear of being wiped out. Yet. More recently in Dark Tide, the symbol of the Great Horned Rat can occasionally be seen painted on the walls of the Nurgle cultist overrun Tertium Hive. In other media while not ripped off as much as some of the other concepts Warhammer created expanded upon from existing sources, like Mesoamerican lizard people or orcs goblins with green skin, Skaven have helped popularize rat people as a more standard fantasy race in a few places. It's theorized by some that the inclusion of Nazumi in the Asiatic settings of Dungeons and Dragons and Magic, the gathering were inspired by the popularity of Clan Eshin, who themselves are theorized to have been inspired by Splinter from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Still, Skaven as a whole remain one of the most iconic things that are wholly unique to Warhammer. The League of Legends character Twitch is clearly inspired by Skaven and has a line referencing them, although he lacks the insane flamboyancy compared to the setting he's in that Skaven have. They even had enough mainstream awareness to be referenced by British journalist Stuart Lee in The Guardian, comparing Brexit negotiations to plague monks. Naturally, the most direct and unexpected place for them to appear is being referenced to exist in both the Japanese and English versions of the anime Goblin Slayer, listed off as a type of monster to specialize in studying. Just the idea of a Skaven Slayer could also be nod to Gotrick and Felix. How the Skaven ended up in the four-cornered world remains a mystery, but seeing as to how they have no holes, skittergats, and love screwing around with warp stone which could explode and open portals, along with the capacity for building rocket ships. Well, pick your poison, non-canon female scave. So it's universally agreed upon both in and out of universe that the only appropriate response to meeting a scaven is to kill them on sight. Right well in an astounding display of hypocrisy. Some furries went yeah but I kinda also want to cuddle one and further demonstrated just how mentally broken certain subtypes of that culture are. So. There is an undercurrent in the darker hidden recesses of TG where furfags like to talk about non rat mother female scave. Many have tried arguing that, given the reverence for the grey seers, combined with the chaotic tinge of the scaven, then surely there are rare female grey seers who are thus spared the fate of their sisters. Others have pointed that since breeders are heavily dosed up with chemicals, then if that fate was spared for some reason, then surely female Skaven would turn out to be at least as competent as their brothers. Still others note that Skaven can't resist tinkering, so it's not impossible a Grey Seer or Master Molder might make use of a thinking breeder. And, in fact, this last argument one even has a dash of canon to it, in CL. Verna's Grey Seer novel, Thankful encounters a Grey Seer, Threat Queer of Underaldorf, who owns two personal breeders he has improved, granting them an unusual clarity of thought, freedom of motion and muscle hidden under their chub. Built like a cross between a breeder and a rat ogre, they're essentially the Skaven equivalent of Amazon bodyguards, and Thankwell is simultaneously horrified and a little impressed at the realization that these harmless females will actually kill any Skaven who dare to threaten their mate. 
This makes them the ultimate bodyguards in the eternal backstab fest that is scathed society. All of these arguments are reaching, understandably. I mean, why not just work with the idea of some developing an immunity or something, but that hasn't stopped fans from dabbling and from scathed homebrew characters or more cheesecake level artwork. One infamous Skaven loving furry even created his own homebrew clan of renegade female Skaven, Clan Sneak, an offshoot clan of Clan Eshin who scavenge on the outskirts of Skaven society and raid weaker warlord clans to steal away their females to bolster their own numbers. Clan Sneak is also known to dabble with human men for pleasure and or procreative purposes. There's even a named gutter runner female in a relationship with an imperial human. His artwork tends to pop up whenever a rat folk thread does or the topic of non-breeder female scaven arises. Thus, the argument about whether or not rat mothers are interesting will probably rage forever. You'd think that with the talks of non-breeder females and clan sneak that there would be more sneak, fem rats, or even scaven related stories in general at the smut archive. But hey what are you gonna do you can't fap it to femscaven stories if there are no femscaven stories.